Good evening. In a socially distanced world, Design United is an optimistic digital platform for collaborative design and connection. In a socially distanced world, Design United is an optimistic digital platform for collaborative design and connection. Design United was created in March 2020 during a period of intense lockdown and quarantine measures within the region. The aim behind Design United was to create an optimistic space for regional dialogue, connections, collaborations, and opportunities for young regional designers and design practices. A much needed network of support and peer mentorship during these uncertain times. Talented young designers and design studios working on design innovation with an approach that is relevant to our South Asian region have been invited to be a part of the platform. We also encourage design students from the region to share their work, be involved in the dialogue and to be an active part of Design United. Design United, most of all, believes in creating a community of designers and design knowledge that is largely contextual with focus on contributing to the environment and our community. Design United believes greatly in a spirit of collaboration and idea exchange. I'm Varna Shashidhar, Founder-Principal of a Regional Landscape Practice, VSLA, based in Bengaluru. I am supported by my very enthusiastic Design United team, comprising of young designers and design students from around the South Asian region. We're also supported by Claywork Spaces in this webinar and in all of our webinars so far. Clayworks creates flexible co-work spaces that focuses on productivity and sustainability. Clayworks believes in creating aesthetically and functionally appealing work environments. They have an innovative, complete work from home solution for these socially distanced times. Welcome to Design United's 25th Design Conversation. In conversation with artist Rajasri Gudi from Pune, architect Lina Nakwi from Karachi, and master perfumer Pranav Kapoor from Kanauj, India. Each week, Design United brings to you design issues relevant to South Asian region with focus on emerging design practices through multidisciplinary presentations and through dialogues featuring works of young emerging designers from around South Asia. Through peer conversations between designers, sharing works of talented practices from around the South Asian region. Through the mentorship series with renowned regional designers and design practices. Also through sharing academic work and academic research of young designers from the South Asian region. Through showcasing process in our in progress segment featuring designers with new practices. Also through Design United's Reading Room, where we, design bibliophiles, discuss books relevant to South Asian designers with authors and publishers. Our next week's conversation is a part of our mentorship series, Design Practice, which features conversations with renowned regional designers sharing their approach to design and their design journey. In the past, we've had uh, regional designers, renowned regional designers join us. Joining us next week on 26 September are two inspirational architects in conversation with us, architect Brinda Somaya and her daughter Nandini Sampat of Somaya Kalapa Associates. Apart from nearly half a century of illustrious practice, architect Brinda Somaya has been instrumental in establishing the Hekar Foundation. She was also instrumental in organizing the conference Women in Design that was held in Mumbai earlier this year. 
So please come and explore with us this multi-generational practice next week. Architect Brinda and her daughter Nandini Sampath will share their work, their approach, their design concern, work methodology. They will also provide glimpses uh, into the film on architect Brinda Somaya and will discuss the book uh, based on their work titled Works and Continuities, covering her prolific practice. With this brief glimpse into next week's conversation, I would like to move to our much anticipated program for today. Today's design conversation is fascinating and much awaited. Beyond the sensorial dimensions lies deeper questions, deeper search, um, you know, that covers the hidden, the unseen issues of migration, cultural memory, caste, identity, power, resistance, history, legacy, and of course, innovation. To dwell into the rich structure of today's conversation are three talented creatives. Architect Lena Nakwi, with roots in Karachi, but living in Sweden. Lena explores issues of home, of diaspora, through her participatory food project, Eat Omeya. She's an architect with roots in the historic city of Karachi. Our second speaker is Pune-based visual artist, anthropologist Rajashri Gudi, who, through her work, explores dimensions of food in a larger, um, meaningful realm. She explores visible instances of everyday power and resistance within the Dalit communities in India. Her project, Eat with Delight, is a documentation of uh, Dalit food um, and beyond. The third creative joining us today is master perfumer Pranav Kapoor. He is a sixth generation perfumer uh, rooted to Kannauj, also known as the perfume capital of India. Through 140 years of legacy, Indian Naturals, uh, the family company that Pranav Kapoor is associated with, has been recognized worldwide for their traditional perfumery methods, which includes steam distillation in copper stills, hand blending using natural plant and flower extracts. The Kapoor perfumery was established in 1880. Pranav will talk about the legacy of his historic family practice in their quest to fragrance, but also innovation that he brings to his rich legacy practice. As we dwell into their culture and artistic journeys, we invite you, audience, to participate, to think, to taste, to smell, and to savor. It's indeed a delight to welcome Lena, Rajeshri, and Pranav to Design Conversation. We will be starting our presentation with Rajeshri Gudi, followed by Pranav, and ending with Lena and her participatory food project. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I work in Pune. I'm an artist with a background in sociology and visual anthropology. And um, there's a slight lag in the, okay, but no worries. Okay. Um, and uh, I started making art about five years ago in 2015. Um, it was sort of the outcome of uh, working with a larger artist community here in Pune and also um, trying to think of how um, the resources that I had sort of gained um, through my study in visual anthropology, like how to um, put them to use, but maybe, uh, you know, not for a specific PhD or something, but like how, how to use the same tools of visual anthropology um into something perhaps a bit more like individual or or um something that can open up my mind a little bit like what happens with academia especially in the social sciences is that because it's sort of so research oriented and so like um rigorous in its uh, in its methodologies it's sometimes hard to really um, open up a topic um, without kind of making it a bit like drab and boring sometimes. 
Um, and so like, I guess calling myself an artist and like under this, I've been able to explore like anthropological methods, but also like feel free to um, really play around and use my own creativity in these topics. And these topics are mainly around the caste system and um, how caste structure functions in in India. Um, I've always been interested in this topic. Uh, my, like I come from a family of social workers and uh, like also who are Dalit. And um, so that's always been sort of, you know, part of the conversation. Um, but I think because I, I, I had the privilege of like going to perhaps a better school or um, uh, like, different circles um that difference between sort of groups of people who believe caste exists <laughs> or caste doesn't exist and uh groups of people who like experience it day to day even though they're all interacting with each other day to day this this these bubbles still sort of um are very clear and my first step i guess my first like entry into art practice um which was through installations was really to maybe like burst this bubble a little bit um so it was really looking at the larger question of you know like yes caste does exist you know almost sort of trying to prove to people who, who didn't believe in it um and then like a few years later i started uh really thinking about food and food as a sort of everyday tool of um of of power um you know it can be anything anything can be an everyday tool sort of um navigation like your commute for a day to day it can be you know what you eat what you drink uh who you talk to who you fall in love with um all of these are sort of very active in um in shaping uh who you are and uh in india particularly um the caste system has always been very careful about um controlling these tools so um you know with with education like dal people were just not allowed to be educated um and it says so in the manusmriti it says so in various um texts that you're just not allowed to be educated. Um, and so once you're not allowed that for thousands and thousands of years, how are you going to like navigate the world today? Um, and, uh, you know, so then basically um, started thinking about food in the same way. Um, this was in 2016 when the beef ban had, uh, was being, you know, actively enforced in India. Um, enforced by so-called Gorakshaks um, and young Dalit people were being lynched and, and older, you know, minorities, um, Muslims and Dalits particularly were being lynched um, because they thought they were eating. Um, and this really made me think about, you know, what, what is this... Um, what does this mean about food habits? Like how can somebody's food habits be so um, perceptive to be so dangerous and take one's own life? Um, and what I sort of started thinking through my research was that really there's no, um, there's no cookbook that speaks about Dalit food. Um, you know, in, in India, when we think about cookbooks, we, um, there's like a stereotype that's reinforced about um, either it being vegetarian or it being, you know, like an Ayurvedic cuisine or um, very specific. And there are a lot of like caste based cookbooks as well, but they're all um, the cookbooks with a sense of real like pride about them. Also, the fact that you have caste based cookbooks is is problematic in itself. Um, but then how, if, if, if a Dalit person has to write a cookbook, how, how are they to do so? Like, how are they to, um, 
get on with it like first you you haven't had access to education for centuries um so who in your ancestors is writing and documenting your food uh to a cookbook like assumes that you know you have a fancy kitchen and you have all these um uh utensils and equipment and different kinds of foods available to you um that's not the reality most dalit communities are still like way below poverty line um but also there's there's also that thing about um like what you have access to um dalit people were not traditionally allowed to own land and um therefore they had to depend on other people for their food they were also um sort of given low jobs in in villages which meant that um they wouldn't get like money for it necessarily they would be given you know share of the village's produce in return uh, which is called baluta here in maharashtra um so there's there's a real like dependence on other people um you know like there's so many stories facts of uh people depending on leftovers for their daily food um leftovers for marriages daily leftovers um there's also hunger that's a huge um aspect of uh, of many dalit lives so how are you going to put all these emotions into a cookbook and so that's when i started thinking about you know the like we think about a cookbook sometimes as a very like accessible um humble nature um that's a uh, humble is what arjun apadurai uses um but in if we look at it and and like how it's uh, sort of constructed often it is a tool of um i wouldn't say oppression but there is a power dynamic playing into it um just like stop me if i'm going too fast um so anyway i i then began sort of searching for writing on dalit food and i found two texts one is isn't this plate indian uh, which was research put together by students of the women studies center in pune university um that's available online as well and another book in marathi called annaheya purna brahma by shahu patori who uh, it is a cookbook um but it's very interspersed with his memories as well um so it's not necessarily a, a conventional cookbook like that um but apart from that i didn't really find much writing in 2016 and what i then began to do was um i started really focusing more on dalit literature um and once i started i realized that dalit literature is just filled with narratives of food filled with stories of um of hunger of guilt of shame of of celebration of feasting and um really sort of made me think about how oppression and and the stomach are so closely linked together um so as i began to read more and more dalit autobiographies i then began to make sort of um little booklets that resemble cookbooks a little bit resemble recipes um but that are adapted from this writing um and really sort of show how sort of how food is a, a very active tool um for caste based oppression um i'm just going to read out a few recipes and share my screen one second is it great um this is uh do your hands smell of raw flesh um this book this recipe booklet oh sorry i'm just going to go right to the end um so the booklets are sort of a5 in size um yeah if you can see me in the tiny screen this is just what they look like 
Um, I think I'm going to just read it out here. Um, is this? Yeah. Okay. So these are the booklets. They're not, I don't know, for you young designers, I'm sorry, they're not at all. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a very design-oriented person in many ways. I just, like, for me, these are just useful. They're small, they're easy to carry, and um, they're really not necessarily an artwork in themselves. They're more of, um, like, an introduction to these books that uh, I'm more interested um, in. So these are really sort of, this one is called When Will Your Life of Living on Arms End? And it's based on Vasant Moon's book called Growing Up Untouchable in India. And um, because I've recognized that, um, you know, Dalit literature is very popular in some circles, but perhaps like unknown as well in some other circles, I really wanted to push this idea of reading more and more Dalit literature because there just is so much from across India and it's very um, complex and very um, very loaded, very diverse in its nature um, and also helps one to break down sort of certain stereotypes that one might have of Dalit communities. Um, let me see if I can try this again. So this is um, an example of a booklet. Um, often I would also just leave them plain. These were just tests that I was um, trying out. So um, this is how they are usually as well. Um, and the photographs are from my uh, family archives. The photographs actually make up a whole other body of work called Eat With Great Delight. And they're just images of my family eating um, as a sort of like to go along with these booklets, but also maybe adding another layer of narrative to them, which is, which is my own narrative. Um, anyway, I will read some of these out. So this is Picnic. Carry your tiffin of Jawar Bhakri and Chutney tied up in dirty rags to the school picnic. After playing, settle down to eat. Boys and girls from castes like Wani, Brahmin, Marwadi, Muslim, Maratha, Tevi, fishermen, goldsmiths, and all the teachers might sit in a circle under a banyan tree. You might be asked to sit under another tree. The tree you sit under might be tattered like you. The wind might shake its branches, produce waves of hot air to hit your face, sit in its broken shadow. Open your bundle, share your bhakti and satni with the other Mahar students. Watch the high caste children offer their fried and tasty food to your teachers. Dare you offer your satni bhakti to your teacher? Would he eat it? The high caste girls might offer you their curry and bhakris without touching you. They might see your food. Don't let it upset you. Try not to feel too ashamed or guilty. Sit like owls watching the high caste children eating together and chatting. With each morsel of your crumbs, chew the lips of the laughing girls. The teacher might ask the high caste children to collect their leftovers on a piece of paper and give it to you. Carry the bundle of leftover food back to the village. Gather in a farm, open the bundle. It might contain crumbs of different kinds of foods. The spicy smell might fill the air. Squat in a circle. Stuff yourselves greedily. Have you ever tasted food like this before? Your stomach might feel as greedy as a beggar's sack. When you get home, your mother, like the victim of a famine, might ask why you didn't get at least a small portion of leftovers for her. Leftover food is nectar. Her words might make you shiver. In school the next day, 
the teacher might ask you to write an essay on the picnic. How should you start writing? Um, so this is what I do basically. Um, so Sharan Kumar Limbai would have written, you know, the, smice, the spicy smell filled the air. We squatted in a circle and stuffed ourselves greedily. We had never tasted food like this before. Our stomach was as greedy as a beggar's sack. So I basically just twist the words a little bit and um, put them into second person, first person. Um, so it sounds like a, a recipe, like directions, um, but the impossibility of uh, replicating them is always present. Uh, and these images that I, I just like, cut and pasted in these recipe books for now are, are ceramics and, and paper pulp work that I made. Um, so this is a ceramic version of a bhakti. And um, the yellow things are like paper pulp ladoos that I made out of the manuscript. Um, so I just like ceramics and, and uh, paper pulp with using especially the Manusmriti is sort of what another side of, of this practice is. Well water. Although the well belongs to the Patils, the spades and shovels, the sweat, the explosives of the Mahars were used to dig and build it. You are the reason for water in the well. But now you are not allowed to draw water from it. You are walking by, feeling tired and thirsty. Go down the well to drink water while your friends keep watch. Make sure no one sees you. Otherwise, you might be badly beaten. Quench your thirst furtively. Touch the water. Gather it in your cupped palms. Ripples might form on the surface. The water inside the earth might shake. Fish. Go to the river to catch fish. Catch them in a sari, a bowl, or a vessel of some kind. At night, cut the fish in the light of a bonfire made with discarded tires. During summer, when the river shrinks, small puddles might appear instead of flowing water. Stuff the puddles with the, sh with the branches and leaves of the shade plant. Its poisonous sap will kill the fish in the puddles. One by one, as the fish die, they wiggle before they fall quiet. Sparkling like silver, their bodies float to the surface. Your hands might stink when you gather the dead fish. Scrub them, split their bellies, remove their intestines, feces, and balloon-like sacs from inside their bodies. Throw all the waste into the river. A live fish might rush to devour it. The smell might attract crabs and snakes. Gather on the riverbank. Fetch a vessel and oil. Bring chili powder, onions, and a matchbox. Gather twigs for fuel. Prepare fish food. Enjoy it while smoking. Gather butts of cigarettes and beedies. Yellow Jawar. Pick up lumps of cow dung. On the way home, wash the dung in the river water. Collect the undigested grains of jawar, swollen and yellow, in the dung. Dry them in the sun until they shrink. Go home when the grains are dry. Grind them into flour. Stuff the clay stove with rags, pea stalks, dry leaves and twigs. Pick up a rag and fetch fire from the neighbor's house. Kindle the fire in the clay stove. Blow on it without a blowpipe. The entire house might fill with smokes with smoke. Insects might flee like outlaws. Make the bhakris from the jawar collected from the dung for yourself. For the family, make bhakris from the flour collected as arms. Refuse to give your bhakri to your grandson. If he quarrels with you, give in. He might notice the stink of dung when he chews it and return the remaining bhakti to you. Get used to eating such bhakti. 
like pushing garbage into a furnace. Show no sign of nausea, no sign of being assaulted by the stink of the dung. Leg bone. Keep your caste a secret. Live as Lingayats, strictly vegetarian. When grandmother comes to visit, you might feel ashamed of her utter poverty. If she brings a bundle with two kilos of wheat from the village and two pieces of leg bone, your favorite, get annoyed at her. Immediately, shut the doors and windows of your house. She might pat your back, encourage you to eat. Who is going to see you? If someone comes to know about this, you might be exposed. Eat the meat late at night. After you take the bones and throw them away, feel relieved. In the morning, if you find the dogs chewing on these bones, try not to feel as if they are tearing pieces off you and eating you up. That's it. That was the six, um, six recipe. So um, each, each booklet, each and I'm about um, 15 now. Um, they're all available like as PDFs on, on my website. Um, and um, for now, that's like a constant practice. Um, that's really sort of, it, it just goes on. Like the more autobiographies I read, the more recipe books I make. Um, it's it's more of an education like for myself about my own history because we we never really um learnt uh much about Dalit history in, in our schools and even in the university that I was in. Um there was always this gap in in our education, which you know, luckily for me my parents filled uh and, and like I had that access. Um, but not many people do. Um, I think there's also, um, there's also so many aspects, like some Dalit families aren't, uh, very, um, open about talking about their histories as well, because there is still a lot of shame and there's still a lot of guilt. Um, so I think young people, not just Dalit people, but young people in general have to maybe make an extra effort to uh, learn more about their history. And when I'm talking about Dalit history, it means like all our history as well. This is something that we are a part of and um, our ancestors have either instigated or have been a product of or um, have been victims of. Um, so yeah, that's, I would like to end now. Any questions later, I'd be happy to answer. And, and um, yeah, thank you for letting me speak. Thank you so much, Rajasri, for um, your really interesting work that really looks um, not as a romanticized version of uh, cooking or cookbooks, but really uh, food as a socio-political commentary, um, also your own exploration of a personal journey. Um, so thank you so much for sharing it with us. Um, I would like to request, Lena, we'd love to have you share um, how you have explored food as a way to develop um, connections to establish space and the idea of community uh, making through your participatory food project. Hi. Um, I'm Lena, and uh, my presentation today is titled Her Secret Ingredient. I hope you can all see it on your screens. Um, a lot of what I do, my practice, uh, simply speaking, has to do with food. Um, in my practice, we establish that food is the arrival point. And in doing so, we discover the journeys, the methods of um, preparation. and sort of celebrate the person that crafted it. The focus is on the process instead of the final product. And that in turn helps us sort of, you know, like I said earlier, unearth the stories, dig into their memories. We really sort of experience the person's personal quirks and it reflects their cultural heritage. And when all of these above things that I mentioned come together, they create that perfect recipe 
that you know that particular creator's perfect recipe for whatever their food that they're preparing. I'm going to give a little um, background uh, on myself right now. I am an architect, and I have been practicing as an architect for the last ten years, and I have been living in Sweden for the last ten years as well. Um, six years ago, when I was looking for a job in Sweden, I had to go to something called SFI. It's um, it's a Swedish government-run national integration program, which is which is which is sort of advertises this language course. It's a free language course for all new immigrants, but um, the interesting thing is that they tried, of course, they combine um, the knowledge about culture and other holidays in the course. So new immigrants and new people that attend um, SFP are expected to and encouraged to attend the course. The SFP becomes, in, in turn like a melting pot for all other cultures because everybody who's new in the country and there's quite a few um they don't speak the same languages they don't you know have similar nationalities they're all at sfp and while sfp was established as an institute to bring everybody together to learn about the swedish culture it becomes this very interesting sort of alternate space where people from other cultures have a space to meet, to interact, to so you know it kind of works in both ways. I am going to also talk about my project today, which is called the Eat Project. So the Eat Project was actually conceived at a FICA in this SFI Institute that I was talking about. Um, FICA is a Swedish institution. Everybody has a FICA. At, in during our work hours, in school, in college, wherever. It's a coffee break, effectively. We have two, usually at 10 in the morning and around two in the afternoon. Um, everybody sits with a cup of coffee. It's for 15 minutes, and it's often accompanied with something sweet, a cookie or something. On Fridays, however, because it's the weekend, it's almost always, in most of the offices that I've worked, there is a fika from the work. So it's something more grand. It's pastry, it's a cake. So it's fika is really a celebration, and sweets really... Um, stick to tradition in terms of that. Now, when I was at SFE, um, I was in a class with 20 people where only three of us spoke English. We were still learning Swedish, so we couldn't really converse in Swedish at that point. There was nobody, um, we didn't share similar cultural backgrounds. We didn't even share similar educational backgrounds. There were some people who had actually never been to school in their lives. Um, we So there was almost nothing common, there was nothing to communicate with, there was nothing to communicate with. But when it was FICA time uh, during uh, uh, SFE, everybody would bring open their lunch boxes. And this is again, very specific, very traditional to the city I'm in. Um, they open the lunch boxes and start passing it around. And everybody would, the smells of the food would fill the air. And people would be like, ah, oh, that smells so good. In whatever language they could speak, in English, in Arabic, in Persian, whatever language it was. And, you know, people would pass their lunch boxes forward. Like, here, here you go, give it a try. And people would start tasting the foods. Now, this is, of course, pre-COVID time, so this was possible. But that was the most interesting part about being there. To, to realize that how it was such a humbling experience because you realize that how little you really know about other people and how much just sort of tasting, eating their food teaches you about them. The, 20, the project in 2015, when I started it, was also the year when the refugee migrant crisis was um, sort of hit Europe, I would say. And there was a lot of discussion. Um, there was a lot of conversation and integration. There was a lot of uh, debate on it. And while the debate proved that it was not an easy, it was just a complicated and complex topic because there was never any, uh, uh, there was there was never any conversation in terms of, uh, uh, yeah, in a city called Umeå, which is in the north of Sweden. The population is 120,000 currently, and uh, it's a university town, so it's about 
the city in its current size or how it's growing, the university is 55 years old currently. And the university was sort of crucial to the city's growth. Currently, even six, uh, around 60% of the population of the city is directly or indirectly involved with the university. So either somebody study or they have a business that has, you know, is getting business of the university, which is a large number. That is the year when I started, I thought that it was important to, this whole conversation of integration was always being done one way. Um, there was a lot of conversation on how the people should be um, integrated, the newcomers. Sweden has always had liberal views and Sweden was very open to um, immigration. So there was a lot of refugees, a lot of migrants that Sweden took in. and. But, you know, nobody was talking about how we are going to use these, the knowledge from these particular refugees. It was, uh, I, there was a huge space there, there was a gaping hole. So I thought, and because I had been meeting these women, and why I am stressing on women is because women, well, statistically are, are more likely to follow their partners, but also most of these men, these women came with to the city of Omeo, found work. They were already working, whether it was in an odd job or they sort of found their way. They, they managed. These women were left to learn the language so they could communicate in the, with the outside world or be able to send, you know, communicate with their children who were now going to Swedish schools or just so they could find a job, kind of like myself. The EAT project became um, a very comprehensive project, which in, sort of comprises a smaller project where we tried to document and investigate these uh, the stories of these women of the diaspora which is settled in Romeo. Um, some of these women were uh, permanent residents, so they're going to be living here. Some were transitional, so they came with the, you know, for two years of education or they were accompanying their husbands or, or somebody for four years, or they were refugees who were placed here by the government. Eat Umeo, which is a very important part, or Eat Umeo is where the public participation project, which is what I am discussing today specifically, is where we hold workshops. We conduct, um, we hold these workshops in a public space, which we run in a public kitchen. And the workshops are led by the women that we have met, interviewed, and photographed the process of. The first, you know, amongst the many questions, we have a process of sort of a, a formula for interviewing with women. So we ask these women, how did they end up in Umeå? It's, you know, it's such a, it's a city so far off. So unless they were placed by the government, what made them come to Umeå? The second question is always, what, what is the food that really reminds them of home? A lot of these women talk about something really, really simple, really basic, like uh, this, and we encourage them to pick something which is very basic, not fancy, to cook for us. We photograph the process, we document the process, and we um, organize a workshop, which is, you know, it's a ticketed event, it's open to the public, but anybody can attend and uh, partake in it uh, and learn what these women are going to teach. It's also sort of important to mention that during these workshops, we really, the idea of these workshops was to focus on the techniques, on the haptics, on sort of, you know, touching the food, on feeling the, you know, the batter, on, on checking the consistency, because of course, there are a million recipes out there. You want to learn something, you just type it in Google, you, you get, you know, you get, you get countless answers. You'll be able to pick whatever you need to pick. Yeah. So these are one of four of the, so far, since the project has been running in from you know, October 20, the project started in 2015 and started, the workshops in started in 2016. These are four of the 20 women that we've already sort of interviewed and documented. They all came to Umeo for very different reasons. They, um, two of the women, one of the women from these four, particular four, does not live in Umeo anymore. She arrived um for her husband's job and she has already left she is i'm talking about yuka who's from japan 
what was really interesting about these women now these four women they taught something very different they have completely different sort of backgrounds they have completely different histories they belong to completely different regions of the world but when they got down to making their own foods they were using their you know the recipes or the methods their mothers or they sort of learned from their families handed down to them and umu was a city these four women were very interesting in terms of umu is a city which is a very activist city it's a very pro environment they're very sort of um into everything it's a very woke city so three out of these four women made foods uh which were completely vegan and it's not that they chose to replace um ingredients it's because they came from regions that never used dairy that never uh that never had to replace ingredients because they they were never found like for for instance this uh, um latvian woman she made a pie made of potatoes it's a it's a it's a harvest food it's autumn food because that's what they get most abundantly at this time of the year so that's what she made similarly uh, like i was talking about earlier about um the workshops and focusing on the haptics how we do that is when we when we sort of design these workshops we made sure that there was going to be no recipes involved so of course the the woman who's teaching or conducting the workshop and again there's a difference it's a workshop it's not a cooking class so it's not one woman demonstrating how a certain food is to be prepared she is going to be she leads the group but everybody is involved in the process and that was always the intention so everybody learns by doing everybody learns by being part of the process and not just learns how to make the particular food but learns about that woman learns about her story because often you know these women that we work with while they're cooking then narrating their stories somebody's asking her why should i chop this so big so she's like i don't really know that's how my grandmother taught me and there's something really beautiful about really sort of getting in on the story as opposed to just reading chop your onions sort of in a recipe and going point by point so when we don't give these recipes we uh, in order to force these people who are participants of the workshop to pay close attention to the process to what's happening so if she says put two cups of flour of course that's a measurement but it's not written on paper so nobody's stressing about you know putting those you know measuring those extra 5 grams of flour because and often that happens there's you know if we split a uh, a uh, workshop in four or five different groups somebody will end up having a runnier batter and somebody will have end up having a drier batter and that's where you know it's interesting because that's where the troubleshooting begins that's where that woman will say okay maybe you're going to add more flour here and the other one to the other one okay if it's you know too dry we cannot add the batter anymore we cannot add some wet ingredients anymore so we do this and so people learn that you know the troubleshooting and so you really sort of um depending on your sense of touch you're really depending on your sense of smell you are going to smell something and how how do you know um it's ready or um how do you know it's done and now i'm going to really go deeper into a few of the workshops that we did and um few of the women that we worked with so one of these women this is a workshop that um we did with a brazilian woman called gabriela gaia and she's this young woman who's been who's moved to sweden to be with her partner who's uh, also not swed he's uh, from poland they both live together here they both study here and now they're living here and she said that she was going to make pound de queijo now pound de queijo for those that don't know it's a it's a it's a bread made with tapioca flour and it's a cheese bread and was a lot of cheese different types of cheese and then you know we went we, we said okay gabriela we're going to photograph you and you know we photograph the process and there was a process during this recipe where you had to rehydrate hydrate the flour and you know she 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 gives us so these women give us written recipes prior to the workshop so when i read them you know i said okay what do you mean by how do you rehydrate the flour what do you mean by that do you just kind of pour water in it and give it a mix and she goes no you you know you take flour in your hands um you 
you take line your hands, you put your hands together like you're praying, and then you kind of rub it down. So it, it crumbs down and falls down. And what a strange way, but but it worked. It, it you know, you got these fine crumbs. But also what was brilliant was that because this is how she explained, we got we document all of this. So we got a glimpse into how um, she comes from Brazil and religion is an important part of their everyday life. And, you know, to put hands together and to pray, I wouldn't uh, explain something that I'm making like that because that's not how I pray. But she does pray like that. And so, you know, she said, put your hands together and just kind of rub like. So it's so contextual. What we do, these, these foods, just in, something so simple. Like food is then just a tool. And you're just using that to explain a whole different story of where you come from and, and you know, where you belong from. Uh, then, next, I'm going to speak of Zena. Zena was, um, she was a student. She was only in Omeo for two years. Uh, we, you know, we decided that she was going to teach us how to make Salma. I do not, I'm not usually uh, the one that decides what these women are going to make. These women decide for themselves. My, I'm just the organizer. So I put together the workshops. I put together the event. I help them sort of go down the steps. So this was a process of, you know, rolling a sarma, which is effectively a dolma. It's also called in some cultures. And, uh, you know, she taught us how to roll it. And we were rolling it. And, you know, everybody was, you know, rolling the sarma in the workshop. And then she goes, make it really tight. So she shows it how to make it tight. And people are like, okay. And then there's this guy who couldn't really get them tight. And he kept joking, like, oh, I'm not getting this tight. And she goes, you know, my grandmother said that if you can't get it, if you roll a tight sarma, you'll make a good wife. And it was hilarious and everybody started laughing. But then again, it was, you know, just this, this small food, this small activity of making food together. It, it, it brought to in this sense of this traditional knowledge, this superstition, this, this small bit of information from Turkey. And I don't think any of the 20 people in that workshop will be able to forget that the tighter a sarma, the, you know, the better a wife you'll be. And there's a, it was this guy, so everybody thought it was ridiculously funny. But it was all these small bits of information that when you actually put down a recipe, you never really, um, you never really document because in a recipe, it's step one, two, three, four. Nobody is talking about the traditions that are laying behind it. Nobody's talking about the um, the history. Um, this workshop with Sukhya Ju, uh, Suk Sukhya Ju, sorry, we were making um, kimchi. And she was our first ever uh, uh, woman that we interviewed and eventually had a workshop with. And for the kimchi during the workshop, she was saying, okay, so you have to salt the cabbage and you know, then you have to weed the cabbage with wilt. And at some point, somebody was like, but how long do we wait? How do we know how long we have to, uh, you know, salt the cabbage? And, and this woman is very interesting because she spoke no Swedish. She spoke no English. And she was, she was only communicating in Korean um, due during the workshop, the day of the workshop, her daughter was translating for us. But before that, it was just me and, you know, she was just using the words. The one day she goes, I need pa. And I'm just like, what is pa? And she's like, pa. And then she took me to the supermarket with her and she's like, pa. And she couldn't find it anywhere. Um, it, it turned out to be spring onions. But so during this workshop, when we were there, she's trying to explain. But people are like, no, I don't get it. Like, at what point is this cabbage done to, you know, for step two? She goes, okay, do this. And most people do this. She makes everybody do this. And everybody goes, she stretched it out. She's like, okay, you are the cabbage now. And people are like, yeah. And she's like, now when you're salted, give yourself a warm hug. Now you are the salted cabbage. So the salted cabbage should really feel soft and sort of moldable. And that's the point when you can move on to the second uh, step. And again, that small, these small sort of 
details sort of reinforce the fact that these workshops are more than just cooking a certain food. They're about exploring these, it's mostly about these women and how they're, you know, using food as a tool to really communicate. The final woman, um, the last case study for today that I'm talking of is Bindu. She was from Hyderabad in, in from India. She was also in India for four years, but she has also left now because she was here with her husband, who was doing a PhD. She um, she was a really fascinating woman. She she approached us herself, and you know, actually, uh, yeah, she was a really good cook. So somebody had really sort of encouraged her to come to us, and and we said, okay, we're completely interested in working with you. Let's let's make something. She's so I right off the bat said. Hey, Bindu, why don't you make a dosa or, or an idli or something really, really, really simple? And she goes, absolutely not. I Maybe I'm going to make a biryani. I mean, I eat a dosa every day. I can't possibly teach a dosa. And then I really had to convince her. I had to convince her that it was not, um, it, she didn't have to cook something really special. She had to cook something so basic. But I, I mean... As much as I love eating a dosa, I didn't know how to make it until she actually, I actually learned it from her. And she was this brilliant person. But because she was, this was her first time outside of India, she had never, um, she had never, she lived literally 10 meters, 20 meters from the supermarket, but she had never ventured into the supermarket because she was just so scared alone. She was so scared of going there that she always waited for her husband to come in the evening so she could go there. She did not really have friends outside of the Indian community because she was, again, not very comfortable with, with she didn't know Swedish, but she, she spoke perfect English, but she was just not comfortable being out in the society. This was her first workshop with us. And um, following this workshop, she continued to start her own course of Indian uh, cooking classes, uh, which were really popular before she left. But what is really sort of important, what we observed and what we really enjoy during this workshop with her for the dosa was that while making the batter during the workshop, so everybody's you know mixing up with the spatulas and there's these four group, different groups and she goes, okay, this is fine that you're using a spatula here, but when you go home, use your hand, sort of lift your hand, Put your hand like this, take your bowl and so forge your battery in with your hand. And everybody is horrified. They're like, why are we mixing the batter like that? And she's like, a good bacteria in your hand is going to start the fermentation. That's what my grandmother said. This is my grandmother's recipe. Because I know everybody has different sort of um, proportions for recipes, uh, for dosa recipes. And so this was like, this is my recipe and this is how we do it. But it was brilliant because it is scientifically back, back even though that is not uh, relevant to what we do or the recipe or the, the way we work with food rather. So these were my four um, sort of case studies examples for today. Um, we realize that food carries both an important symbolism and shared rituals and retaining the cultural memory of our roots. Food harbors nostalgia, it right? helps humans move from place to place without really losing themselves. And that is why it is so important to record the stories and to document the process, because in doing, in doing so, we really you know, capture the personalities of the makers. That's it. Thank you for today. Thank you so much, Lena, for a fascinating presentation. I mean, that really dwells into food as a personal narrative, um, ideas of communities coming together, especially women. So a uh, lovely way of documenting and beautiful language as well uh, in the way it was presented. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you sharing your work with us today. I would now like to request uh, Pranav Kapoor to kindly share his presentation. So, uh, let me just start off by talking about myself. Uh, fragrance has always been a part of my life. I mean, I've literally been surrounded by it while growing up and it's not like this is what I was pressured to do by my family to get into the fragrance business or to join the business. But it's something that I think I was just 
I mean, because it was all around me and my grandfather too has uh, somehow the other always encouraged me towards fragrance. Like he would play these little games with me where he would dip a perfume stick in one of his creations and ask me to tell him what notes are you getting. And uh, like I said, nobody really pressured me into the thing and I moved on and went ahead and did culinary arts which is somehow still related to fragrance and flavor. And then it all brought me back down to my heritage in 2014 when I started uh, Indian Naturals. So before I go ahead, let's start a little bit of the history of my family. Since uh, everything has basically now been commercialized in terms of the fragrance industry where everything is factory produced, you know, a lot of like, uh, perfumes like the whole hand blended thing is really out the window this is something that has been going on in Kannauj for centuries the practice of distilling using copper stills where everything is done by hand from picking off the wood chips to picking the raw material by hand and distilling it and transferring it to individual bottles is still today done by hand so which is why we always wanted to uh, with Indian Naturals highlight the fact that it it's hand blended artistry and uh, now taking you back in time this is when uh, in 1880 when uh, the first distillation unit was started by my great 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 grandfather and uh, it is set up around so Kannauj is basically a very historic city with its mention in various texts since the 6th century onwards and this is situated at a part where the old ancient city where the ruins of the old fort of Jaichand, if you heard of Prithvi Raj, and if you've heard of Harshvardhana ruling north of India, that was its capital. So this area where the distillery, the first distillery was set up is around the fort. And today, as you can see in the second picture on the back, you see a little mountain behind the flowers. So those are the ruins of the fort because it was plundered uh, by the Mughals when they had entered India in the 13th century. So all of the entire fort is now a big mountain where you can still see turrets and stuff peeking around it. So this is the old, the first unit that came up. And now on the right hand side, you can see that this is the bark that we have. And uh, a lot of cultivation of our flowers uh, for distillation happens at the bark. So moving on from, 19, uh, from 1880 to 1929, <coughs> since my family has always been uh, taking an active part in uh, upliftment of Kannauj, be it in a social way or a political way. Uh, in 1929, my great, great, great grandmother started a girls school by her name. Her name is like was Shishila Devi. And she started this with 12 girls. And the aim was to basically, and the fees was minimal, almost next to nothing. And the aim was to educate uh, and uplift women back then which is 1929 so you can Im imagine pre-independence and teaching languages like persian uh, urdu sanskrit english hindi so which was something very progressive for a place like Kannauj, because like Kannauj even today is not very well known across the country as of the last four years it's been there because publications have been speaking about the perfumery business and stuff but in 1929 there was literally nothing there so the girls school was started and this is the girls' school today where we have our annual Diwali celebrations and everything. And today, in 2020, we have around 1,600 girls. And we are also including a perfumery course. And I'm bringing down a chef course uh, for girls. So, you know, to add to the curriculum. Because being in a fragrant town and being, uh, you know, where, where a school is made solely for women, I think it's very important that perfumery is also and basically give uh, women an opportunity to become perfumers. So this is, uh, yeah, the school. Now we've come down to 1945 and the, this is the time when the British were leaving India and the distillery as it stands today was purchased from a colonel that was leaving the north, who was part of a cotton mill at that point. And on the left, you can see these are copper stills. <coughs> Sorry. These are copper stills, which are used to distill essential oils. And on the right is the current picture of the distillery as it stands today. At that point in time, in 1945, 
till about 1960, this was the largest sandalwood distillery, second largest sandalwood distillery in Asia. And uh, the only distillery in the north of India, apart from the one in uh, Karnataka, to the only one in uh, north India to be distilling pure sandalwood oil and using that as a base to make others. But since the ban of sandalwood in 1996, today any other that you get will not be made using pure sandalwood. It uses another cheaper uh, chemical alternative. Now we get down to, uh, now we are in 1960. So basically what has happened now is that at this point in time, the business has branched out and has uh, had an office set up in Calcutta. So this is a fragrance. This is the first brand that my grandfather launched. And incidentally, today it's, it's his birthday as well. Uh, this is the first brand that he launched and uh, by the name of Riga Perfumery and called it Aliza. The unique thing about this is, is the fact that it was made uh, first for the domestic market, but somehow it did really, really well overseas. Maybe because at that point in time, one could use real musk. Now, real musk, we all know, comes from the male gland of the deer. And now, since poaching is banned and you cannot kill animals, and you know, like we are all practicing cruelty free uh, uh, production. So now we don't use real musk, but this particular fragrance uh, has real musk in it and is very unisex, which is it's delicate and floral and spicy and woody at the same time. So, this is the first thing that first brand that came out in 1960 from our Calcutta office called Elisa. This bottle is really cool. So this, now we are down to 1980. The business at this point has basically reached global heights. Like if all of you, I mean, some of you would know most of these companies. These are the biggest fragrance producing companies in the world, even today. And by 1980s, the family had its global presence as a uh, providers of sandalwood oil, atas and compounds to all the leading perfume houses and developing a close relation with some of the founders of these companies so much so that we even invited them back to Kannauj and they've come over and they've seen uh, our distillation and everything. So now that being the history of where I'm coming from, a brief one, now we come on to Indian Naturals. What you can see on the picture on the left is a stone carved statue uh, from the 10th century, which uh, I mean, I haven't included the entire thing, but is uh, basically depicts the four heads of Vishnu. Like I said, Kannauj being a very rich, with, with very rich history and great archaeological finds, these statues were recovered when our distillation unit was being made. Like they were all buried underneath the ground. So Kannauj, as you know, is made on top of ruins, like my house, my the school that we are, like my school. The factory, everything is made up on top of old ruins, which were once uh, a thriving, uh, which was a thriving fort and a very populous uh, place. So, taking from my grandfather's uh, notes from 1960 when he started his first uh, brand, apart from the family firm, I started Indian Naturals in 2014, and. Uh, basically a fragrance solution company that not only uh, diversifies into fragrance, but I did also want to include my uh, culinary uh, uh, aspect to it and get into the food and beverage industry by combining my culinary expertise with my fragrant heritage. So the first three years were of the lab was spent basically in research and understanding as to what is really missing in the fragrance industry in India and how do we put India on the global map when it comes to fragrances. You know, basically revive the rich heritage of Kannauj, uh, which throughout history has been known to supply uh, fragrance oils to the Mughal queens. Uh, there's a text where Noor Jahan used to get her rose uh, oil for her baths from Kannauj. And during the 6th century, again, Harshwardhan uh, had uh, basically encouraged perfumery uh, as a very thriving industry. So the whole point of coming to Indian Naturals is not just to basically carry on what, you know, like a B2B, what my family has been doing, but also to carve our own niche as to where can I take this? What am I bringing to the table that is really going to put Kannauj into the limelight? 
So basically the lab was created with one aim to provide fragrance solutions across the board. Now that can come from various sectors. Now it can come from FMCG, it can come from the hospitality, from FNB, from corporate personal gifting and even religion. Now that's, I mean, as surprising as that may sound, but religion is a big industry and I will get to that later. Moving on. So now we come to the scent library. So uh, when it comes to the scent library in terms of creating a fragrance for retail under our own brand, uh, my inspiration has always been to adapt from ancestral formulations and kind of blend them in the form of uh, something that is appealing to today's sensibilities and taste. So because like I said, like our hashtag itself says modern tradition, like I coming from a family that's been a generational business for the last 140 years, we don't want to let go of what we've done in the past. In fact, we are really proud of what we've done. And we really want to showcase that. So hence, I take, like you can see this, I mean, the picture is inverted. But this is a gulab a fragrance on your right, which is from the family firm. And this particular blend is from 1960. So, I mean, we have a lot of these perfume uh, oils and we have a lot of fragrances that have been aging for the last, uh, you know, 40 years, 50 years. Some have been aging for 30 years. So, I mean, we don't sell them, but it's also... Uh, fascinating for when people come down to visit and then we show them the lab we show them this so then it's it's like a trip down memory lane you take them through the various generations of what things were being done then and what was the fragrance profile of people back in the 60s when we were exporting to europe and what were people doing in the 50s like the way uh fragrance has evolved i mean it's just like let's say fashion for that matter you know it's it has evolved it has a whole timeline of something where when he started off, was really strong, powerful, musky. You know, if you remember things from the 90s, if you anyone remembers fragrances from the 90s, are very different to what is today. Like now there's more complexity to things. So basically, like I said, we didn't want to uh, just start afresh. We wanted some bit of history and some of my, you know, like sentiments basically uh, attached to this. So hence, it's like, you know, paying... Uh, March to my grandfather and my ancestors by taking, adapting from their formulations and creating something which is very uh, today. So you can imagine the fun of the 1960s intertwined with the technological precision of the 2000s. Now that's a fragrance. So, you know, something which has, uh, which is flowery, but has a metallic precision to it of the 2000s. So, hence, the fragrances that come out of a scent library will always have a very nostalgic appeal to them. Same with this. So, this on the left, as you can see, are all line of ancestral formulations from a deep shamama at the end, which is the dark one, uh, which basically comprises of around 27 to 28 uh, spices and herbs that go into making something like this. And then to your various versions of the gulab, which is obviously like evergreen now so basically like i said I'm, I'm a chef too by profession so putting my chef degree to use i have devised formulations that would enhance the experience of a cocktail or even a salad for that matter since smell and taste are so related like the idea was to basically create a mist that pleases your olfactory palate without it altering the flavor of the concoction so in the sense, like if I take my lavender mist and I spray it into a cocktail so extra, which has gin, tonic, lavender and a peach sorbet, every time you take a sip, you will get a whiff of lavender. Now that whiff will transcend down to your palate. But when you take a sip of it, you will not taste the lavender. And that is the, since, you know, like if you have a cold, you can't taste anything because your smell and taste go hand in hand. So which is why we wanted to create a sensory experience you know an experiential cocktail and uh, that's what it does for example also if you take the other one there is uh, the next one you see a paloma so it's the same thing a spray of lavender lilies and grapefruit but when you taste it it's tequila as it would be in uh, a paloma cocktail and we use all edible and food grade uh, essential oils to make these kind of concoctions 
So now we come down to the other branch of what Indian Naturals does is custom fragrances. So now custom fragrances is basically, you know, it's just much more broader than being like, oh, I want a floral, oh, I want something spicy. It's basically a narrative that a person provides me. And in this case, it's the family that started the Polo Cup, uh, the general uh, Sparrow Polo Cup. And how the fragrance had to resonate with the founder's personality as well as with the sport. So now the founder being uh, Mrs. Son uh, Sonia Rajinder and the sport being Polo, they are total opposites. You know, as you, if you read the description, it says, you know, she, she likes roses and everything. But when you think of the sport Polo, you don't think roses, you think horses, you think leather. You know, you think, you know, sweat, masculine, musk, that those are the, those are the feel, those, those are the fragrances, those are the notes that will come to your mind. So as much as it is challenging, it is equally exciting as to how both these things can be blended. Like I said, see, the thing is today, most of the things are basically based on a sex appeal. Like if you look at fragrances in Europe and stuff, it's, if you see any ad for any fragrance by any of these designer, this thing it's based on a sex appeal, right? But what we wanted to do was to go beyond that, to push the whole sex. I mean, obviously, fragrances are sexy and they do turn you on. But, uh, but we have to go behind, we wanted to go beyond uh, the sex appeal and capture something meaningful, you know, something sentimental. So basically, and uh, this one, this particular fragrance was. Uh, part of the trophies given to the winning team. So it had your, you know, the tenacity of cedar wood. It had, you know, the delicate ness of rose mixed with leather, mixed with grass, because, you know, you're playing on the polo field. So everything, each and everything, like even a feeling can be put down in terms of a fragrance. And that is what I bring to the table. That is what I want to put forth as a sixth generation perfumer. So now this is the other angle of it. So like we've done food and beverage. We have done my own scent library uh, from ancestral formulations. And we've done custom fragrance for things like polo. Now we come into space scents. Now the thing with space scents is that if you walk into a room and the room is smelling has a certain, let's say, an odor to it that is not pleasing, you will Ultim, you will just be put off. Let's say you go into somebody's house. Each and everybody's house has a certain fragrance to it. Naturally, not saying whether they put some diffuse or something. Naturally, because it's their scent. So when you come to your own, when the moment you enter your own house, you feel a sense of comfort. You feel a sense of comfort. When you walk into your own room, you feel at ease. You feel at ease because you can smell you around you. You know, you know which is why fragrance plays a very important part in mood upliftment. So when places like this, for example, Shiv Nivas Palace, when people like this approach us to create a scent for their spaces, it's basically that every time a guest walks into a hotel, they need to be wowed by what they are seeing. They need to be wowed by what they're seeing and the scent of the place has to match the visuals. So, uh, Maharaj Lakshraj Kumar, who is the one, the Udaipur, who belongs to the Udaipur royal family, and he's the one who owns these palaces. So, he commissioned me to create a scent uh, for Shiv Nivas Palace. And the fragrances are dispersed uh, through a unit in, uh, through your AC centralized air conditioning ducts. Now, the palace basically had been going some minor tweaks in terms of its interiors, because the exterior facade is very Rajput architecture, and all of your architectural students, uh, majors so you know like the rajput architecture but the interiors are very vibrant and if you look at it it's very european very like art decor so even though the chandeliers furniture carpets and most of the priceless stuff dating back a century was still part of the new york Tower, but it was redone in such a way that gives you an art decor french shadow white you know, which blends so seamlessly with the heritage Rajputana architecture. So when he approached me for this, I was like, yes, absolutely. I totally agree with you because, you know, such striking interiors did need a fragrance that would transcend instantly into olfactory storytelling. You know, the moment one enters the palace. 
So the nose in this case had to match the eyes, which is the interiors. So hence we created something around the interiors of the palace. So Shiv Nivas. I wish there was a way where, you know, we could just electronically send fragrances also. So you guys would, you know, just understand and smell the perfumes while I'm talking. Okay. So post that, then we came down to his personal fragrance. Now the Maharaja wanted something for him too. And the thing is now this comes with, this came with a bit of a burden because he is the 76th custodian of the Mewar lineage, you know. And it's, it's a big deal when, you know, somebody who has, they, they hold pride in the fact that they have never been defeated by the British. They hold pride in the fact that their throne has never been taken for 76 generations. Then you know that this is, I mean, this is not just any other client, like this is something big. And since he, you know, and the surprising thing is that first, obviously, I was a bit intimidated when I had to go meet him and he was really kind and he was very humble and all of that. But you know that we did have one thing in common and that was our love for roses and uh, i mean i love rose i'm wearing it on my shirt today so <laughs> plus kanoj is also famous for rose but he had a lot of interest in rose in fact so much so that he was cultivating it in udaipur which is a region where rose cultivation is not only impossible the variety you will get is just i mean pathetic to say the least but uh, we got talking about our love for roses and taking that into account, taking his lineage into account, a fragrance was created to match not just his personality, but where he's coming from. The 76th custodian, the entire fact that they are proud of being uh, Rajput, the fact that they are proud of not having been defeated once. So all of that, all of that plays down into a fragrance. And that's what we did with the Maharaja. Now moving on, that's another, this thing for Lakshraj Supriwan. So now coming down to the Indian Naturals Discovery Set. Now the Discovery Set basically is a collection from our Scent Library. And if you look at the names, there's something, I mean, I don't think anyone has heard of these kind of names. I'm not kind of like blowing my own horn. Maybe a little bit, but that's fine. Uh, so as you can see, powder room, very, very, I'm over it. Something that resonates, again, coming back to the hashtag modern tradition, something that res resonates with people today, yet me being true to my heritage, yet being true to my lineage and uh, creating these uh, fragrances. Because like I said, you know, like everything that we are used to today has been so commercialized in terms of the European fragrance that people in India themselves don't give importance to Indian fragrance. Whereas the West now, the West in fact for the last five to six years has been going mad, mad over oils and fragrance oils from India. But I think Indians are still to be educated about it. And uh, the narrative of my fragrance is basically the reason why we do uh, such unique uh, stuff is because what I want to do is to provide a visual imagery in one's mind while you're reading the description and then add, a, then I put a fragrance to it. So when you read the description to when you smell it, it matches in your head. For example, Sang, like this particular one. Now the Sang is a fragrance that is an homage to a Chinese scholar, Yuan Sang, who traveled to Kannauj in the 6th century. And now that time, Harshwardhan was ruling India and Kannauj was his capital in the 6th century. And it is so strange because at that point in time, Kannauj had a flourishing Buddhist population. Like there were 100 monasteries and there were about 10,000 monks that were living here. So when Yuan Sang had traveled down to Kannauj, he was hosted by the king and there was a week long festival, which is widely documented as well. So this particular fragrance is an homage to a Chinese scholar who had come down to India and basically talks about a vibrant harmony between the Orient and the Hind, which is not what we are seeing today in 2020, but was very much so back in the 6th century. So, um, yeah, and that's basically what Sang is. And so the fragrance, basically, when you smell it, 
will transport you to that narrative of you know a week long festival in the 6th century that is being hosted uh by a king what is and uh, now we are at the five elements range which is the last and the five elements range basically is a daily uh, you know like since chit jal pavak gagan samira are five uh, tats were according to the indian scriptures that make up all of our existence which is the air wind water uh, earth and sky so a range basically that talks and is resonates with the old factory senses about the five elements is here and that is it i think then perfumery tourism is something that i would like to start but i think my time is up so i'm just going to stop here and that's for today thank you guys thank you so much thank you so much pranav for taking us through this uh, through a fascinating journey into um really looking at design through the olfactory senses um so really appreciate um the innovation that you're bringing uh, into your rich lineage so uh, that deals with indian perfumes with this i would like to open the session to conversation we'd like to invite all our speakers to um join and i would also like to take this opportunity to welcome our two moderators for today's conversation anudipti arul a young architect from bengaluru anudipti graduated from dayanand sagar college of architecture bangalore last june and is exploring natural construction technique at thannal our second moderator for today is chandana jr an architect who is pursuing her master's degree at in landscape architecture at rit college bengaluru Welcome Anudipti and Chandana. With this, we would like to open the session to conversation. Uh, audience, we welcome your questions, and we invite you to type your questions for our designers, Lena, Rajeshree, and Pranav. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Varna, and thank you, Team Dio, for the wonderful opportunity. And I would like to thank uh, even the speakers. Uh, it was very insightful uh, presentation. So my first question to you, Rajeshree. So it was amazing to know about your work. Yeah. Uh, given your background, how did you go about documenting the Dalit food, and what was your turning point that uh, led to focus on this sort of work? Hi, thank you. Um, I think the turning point for me was the Una protests, where um, you know. before that in una four dalit youth were lynched because they were transporting a cow um and basically this was their job profession this was their caste job that um a lot of dalit families have to have and they're not necessarily given opportunities to get other jobs uh very easily and um, so, and this is not really nobody wants to carry dead animals as a living necessarily um so this is not really something they were doing by choice but they had to and yet they were stopped and lynched and like all of this was videoed i'm sure you remember i don't know um in 2016 um and this became like a national outcry um so and because of that all of una came out in protests um and i found that a really like big turning point uh into me thinking with uh, my own community's relationship with food um and where where these roots lie like where where do these ideas of purity and impurity come from what what is this idea behind beef being um impure uh what is this idea of like vegetarianism being more pure um and is there something more insidious to it than simply a respect for the cow um so yeah that was really the turning point and uh, most of my research like all of like all these cookbooks are based on the dalit literature i read 
So I don't necessarily go out and collect recipes myself. Like I'm not really interested in that aspect. Um, but it's really looking at like how people who have already written about food, like how to really amplify their voices. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Rajeshri. Um, Alokitri, can you please take over the next question? Yeah, hi. Um, my question is for Lena. I found your work really interesting, how you bring uh, people and cultures together through food. But since you're an architect, does it influence your work in any way? Um, my work as an architect? Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, your background as an architect, does it have any influence on your work? In um, project? That it does. I mean, that is, I would say, as an architect, why I started this project was really because, you know, you, for all your six, seven years of education, you're taught to understand the context before you design. And um, so, in doing so, I was really trying to, I mean, it was really, I was trying to question the city because as a student, it's a very different city. But um, when you're living in the city and looking for work in the city, it presents itself as a very different um, environment. And I was wondering what, I mean, and I think it goes a little beyond me just being an architect at that point, because it made me wonder if some, I have studied in the city, I have friends in the city, I've been, I had already been living in the city for a few years before I went to the Swedish Institute. So if somebody like me was feeling a bit displaced, what would happen to these you know numerous or what was happening to these numerous other women um, that were in the city who did not have any sort of connection or history or um or even education really so i think it's it was a little sort of to and fro but it, yeah, i think it's been going hand in hand and yeah that's so true how you said about context making a difference in your work. Uh, Chandana, would you like to go next? Uh, my question is to uh, Pranav. So as the couple family has been recognized worldwide for your perfumery methods, tell us about a significant olfactory memory from your childhood, which is close to your heart. I think there are a bunch of them in fact but like you know sometimes how if you smell something in your childhood like could be for me i think the smell of my dormitory in boarding school you know when i walked in and it's just so weird that there have been three to four times in my life as an adult where i have just i don't know maybe i was out and about doing something and i got a whiff of that same particular smell so you know like and it instantly took me back to my dormitory as somebody in class two and three, you know, and because my warden was really strict. So <laughs> that's the memory that I have because, yeah, I mean, it's strange. And also the smell of uh, the linen that my grandfather used to wear. So these are two things that I get a whiff of every now and then. Sometimes when I open this cupboard, I get that. But this dormitory is something that's not leaving me. Really, it's garden quite a bit. Thank you, Prana. Uh, Anuti, could you please take up next question? Yeah. So, uh, Rajeshree, um, your work has a lot of personal influence in it, right? So, apart from this influence, uh, how do you focus and dwell on the social issue? What do you, um, how did you start thinking about this, apart from your personal experience? I don't know really like I guess for me everything's been like stuck like when it comes to talking about caste the social and the personal are always very mixed up so I don't think I would have been able to speak about it if it weren't coming from a personal space um I think yeah that that wouldn't have been possible um yeah um chandana oh so my next question is to lena so uh, first of all your work is so fascinating uh regarding your project eat world series how did 
the women connect with any cultural uh, aspects associated with respect to food is there any key element that has inspired you to take forward on any particular project um eat the world series so for for the project um it's 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 i don't know if there's one particular one i would say or one particular reason because they've each my interactions with each of them have been so different and i don't pick them you see like i don't pick out of a box of who to pick we basically come interview and go ahead with whoever is willing to be interviewed and documented is that or did i not understand your question or answer your question uh yeah yeah, yeah definitely kind of it has answered so thank you so much uh, so uh, i would like to um I'll, uh, tell anudipti to ask another question to the speaker yeah another question i have is for prana uh since you're coming from a family of perfumers and you have a whole legacy to carry on um it would have obviously you know evolved a few ways to adapt to the current times but what is the true essence of the kapoor of humory that you think should never change like through the generations that are yet to come as well oh that's so really oh uh, that's a very deep question because i don't know if i would want to have kids to carry on firstly so but uh, i think the essence of it is basically being rooted to the city that has that we've made our home and has given us a lot and we've given it a lot back so we feel and i feel and even my family has always felt this responsibility towards kannauj you know like be it in terms of upliftment of women like you know the girls school that we have or you know the fact that i want to start tourism in kannauj and kind of put it on a global map and have all kinds of people come down and visit uh, visit uh, this place so i think the fact that we want to give back to the place that we are from and where everything started from is something that uh will not change even if like after me when i leave things to the trust like whoever takes it forward from there and that is something that will not change ever i have something for rajeshree though actually i really want to talk to you about it dude first of all like this is such a unique thing i mean honestly speaking i never ever you know i mean we are all surrounded by dalits right but i have never ever really thought like it's honestly almost like an eye opener of sorts you know and it was really deep too i did not expect it to move me the way it did but uh, have you made this into a fully realized cookbook um thank speaking you from a chef's perspective you know just um yeah that's i mean so they are like all little like booklets so there are about 15 of them um they're all online um and then whenever i have shows i um people can either pick them up from there for free or like there's a nominal charge or something um so they're all sort of available like that but it'll be difficult to cook from them as i said <laughs> like ah So no, that's what I mean. Like, is it like a fully realized recipe by recipe that this is all? Like, have you added something of your own to the mix, or it's no, like? No, I'm just focusing on like how Dalit writers already write about food. Um, so really looking at like each uh writer and their background. Um, in sort of how they experience food, how they experienced hunger. etc so you said that there is there's always i mean obviously we know documentation of this for a really long time so when was the first thing documented about the dalits is it the 19th century or what there's always been some documentation in general like i guess documentation started when the british came um okay. but uh, from our own documentation of ourselves um there like really you would look at 
Dalit literature from the 1940s onwards. All right. The Dalit literature movement mainly in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Post freedom leading up to freedom movement onwards, basically. Yeah, I mean, the more, like, it's, I guess it's like logical and that, like, the more access to education people had, the more they could write about their story. Right, right, right. right, right, even right. When oh it my God. To... This is such an eye opener. <laughs> Like, honestly, then then ever think it like you know from this side of the coin. So that's fine. Glad, thanks. <laughs> so uh, Rajeshri, this question is to you. Uh, so uh, how does your background um, in anthropology link to your project? Um. Well, I guess it 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 is a fairly like anthropological topic when like food of certain communities and my grandfather was also an anthropologist who did a lot of like um research around food cultures and food ways um so i guess the topic in itself is quite anthropological but in terms of research instead of doing like on 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 ground research um and collecting data for myself i'm looking at literature as data um because we haven't really like because there's not enough like history on dalit communities there's no um there's not enough data out there so in fact dalit literature is like a great source of dalit history um comparative to other forms of research Thank you. Uh, Anuditi, could you please take up next? Uh, we have an interesting question from the audience to Prana. Um, so although India has such a strong history in fragrances, especially relating to the Mughal royalty, how are people today in India not aware and in touch of these roots? Why is it? Why is there a greater fascination with Western fragrances? I mean, on a broader scheme of things, it's not just Western fragrances, it's Western everything. It's where the British left us. Yeah. They made us feel like shit and bounced. <laughs> that everything we do is great and everything you are doing is questionable. So, which is why we've always looked at the West for progressive things. But as times are changing, you know, like everything is going back to the scriptures. Everything is, back, is going back to ancient roots. Now, everyone is like going up to yoga and stuff like that. So... The thing is now, and honestly speaking, I mean, this is not like dissing the country or whatever, but once something becomes popular in the West, it sells like hotcakes in India. Yeah. So, and, ad and adapting that, which is why we've been focusing a lot on the people outside, but I think some Indians, the ones that are well-traveled and stuff, do get it. But even there are people, uh, there are people, you know, there's actually a, disparity it's a it's a very class thing you know Rajesh you you know you you get what I'm saying like it's basically there is the middle class and then there's the upper class and then there's this class in between that's trying to get to the other side you know mm -hmm. so the middle class has always been using others and stuff like that and they still want it and they want something nice easy cheap and they they kind of like they want to use that. But then there is this class that's trying to move from the middle to the upper who think that everything Western and everything from Europe or France is a better scene. So, well, that's the... And then there's the upper one where there are some people who are coming back to the Indian roots. So, in all honesty, I mean, for something to be popular in India, you have to make it sell in the West first. Yeah, that's sadly true. Sadly true, yeah. I mean, it's reality. So, so uh, we have next question to Leela from an anonymous audience. So, how does your background as an architect inform your process of community building and inhabiting space through food? Um, so, as an architect, when, we, when, when we've been using food to create these um, workshops, hold these workshops, 
we've been sort of giving an opportunity to create these spaces for interaction. Because in a society, like when you talk about migrants and you talk about migrants in a very predominantly white um, Western context, you're also talking of um, a society which is sort of only, it's not really giving space to the immigrants yet. And I'm not talking about just physical space. It's also space to ex to express themselves. So this is just sort of a, if we start by creating a, an opportunity that by giving them space to do something, to have the workshop, to share their um, knowledge, and then go further by, you know, like like I said, like that example of um, Bindu, where she went on to have her own workshop, so actually physically occupy space and in, in sort of in society, in the community. I hope that is enough. Yes. So I would like to tell, uh, ask Anudita to ask a question. Okay, this question is for all the three of you. Um, we're all curious about, you know, what you're trying to achieve in the near future. What are you trying to, uh, what are your future endeavors going to look like? Um, Rajeshri, would you like to go? Um, well, I, don't, I guess, um, not very different from what it is now, just to keep working. Um, I'm not really like. I have been focusing on the relationship of food and caste for the last like three, four years. Um, and uh, now I, I do tend to do more like photo archive work and uh, ceramic work, more related to, yeah, sort of where, where these gaps in documentation lie and where these gaps in, um, uh, in, visibility and invisibility lie so i guess food is a part of that but it's also much more like nature like pilgrimage like moving around borders um so to just continue hopefully and i can make money out of it hopefully oh that sounds really interesting i can't wait to see thank you uh lena um Hi. um I have, with all this documentation, because we've just been sort of putting it together currently, um, the idea is to put together a sort of, um, not a recipe book, but a book of these women's personal stories. Um, it will hold their recipes, but um, the focus will be, um, like you saw in the presentation, on sort of what their works of sort of explaining how they explain the recipes and sort of it'll be their recipe i'm not translating a recipe for them so if she says that you're going to have to use your hands to you know you know to hydrate the flour whatever that's exactly how it's going to be it's sort of yeah recipes sort of translated super simply into design visuals that's the plan oh that's really nice as well it's like um you're documenting a family's or uh, some sort of a more intimate cultural uh, sort of recipe being passed on, I guess. Sounds like that. Very interesting. I and, just want to say, Rajeshri, I actually attended a, um, a webinar by you a few months ago, and I've been so interested by your work since then. And so it was so incredible to actually be sitting on the same panel as you right now. Big, it, it's just it's just so fascinating the the sort of the, the the process is really incredible how you do it thank you no i really enjoyed yours too and pranav's um you know just all these different acts actually where we are sort of speaking about very similar things but in such different contexts which is quite important to recognize um and I really enjoyed listening to your presentations as well. Thank you. Oh, my turn. Okay, uh, so <laughs> basically, um, for me, it's perfumery tourism. I mean, fragrance and all, yes, yes, get it out there, etc. But perfumery tourism is something that, I mean, we've already started work on. And in 2021, we would be ready to be open to visitors. 
which is not only going to be the first in India, but it's going to be the first in Asia, and that will put a notch on the global map. And I mean, it's a very ambitious project because it's going to change the face. The entire city works. It's going to change the economy with something opening up, and with, you know, opening up to tourism just opens up so many more avenues of revenue for everybody in the city that people will just have to step up, you know, like evolve. Because right now, Kannauj is stuck in time, and you know, <clears throat> on some level, I may be doing it some damage by opening it to tourism too. But you know, it's it's a uh, the two sides to a coin. Yeah, that's true. But like you said, Kanauj needs to be put on the map. But it's it does good. need to be put on the map. Yeah, yeah that's my sure. That's so Chandana has another question. So we have a question from audience. Uh, Joel has a question. I think all three of you can answer for this. The all factory experience builds upon not only on memory but purity and accessibility of smells. How does Dalit food, migrant experience, and perfumery transfers the accessibility, the acceptability of smells, odor, and aroma? Okay. So, uh, one second. Can somebody start while I just look this up? I can. I can. I can start. I mean, when. In terms of migrant experience, I think it's process. It's um, the acceptability, especially in the city where I am, because it's such a small city, it's not there. But over the last 10 years, I've seen it increase. And that's how, you know, that's what the project is about. about you, we spoke about space earlier. That's how the immigrants or the migrants rather are occupying space. Because 10 years ago, there were no exotic food stores here. Currently, there are at least five and there's more opening. I mean, you know, of course, there was an Indian restaurant, but now you actually see smaller restaurants opening up. It's just that people are opening up to accepting different tastes. Um, the fact that, you know, there are migrants that are coming in, they're going to bring with them different flavors. And I think here it's also really important to talk about aromas because, you know, when I... If I'm going in a bus and, you know, my, my coat is reeking of methi, that doesn't work. It doesn't work. And so it's really like, but if I do that, perhaps in New York, it's still okay because okay, okay, it's okay in the level of acceptability. People are aware that this is going to happen. People get offended here. No, but that's but a real thing, you know, that's a real thing. Like Asia, like us Indians, and like, you know, like people... Like all of us, like we are known to have this curry smell. Like when you go out, you're in a lift in London, you're smelling of curry because that's what you're eating. Like what you're eating is what Absolutely. your skin is radiating, you know? Absolutely. So I think it's a process. Like acceptability will come with, it does not come with ignorance. So it's going to come yeah. with visibility. So once the visibility increases, I mean, this, I'm just talking about the migrant culture and the migrants. So, and now I'm done answering my end. Thank you, Lena. So I hope Joel this has answered your question. So we would like to end with this session. Add a little here. bit more. Yeah. Sorry, I just want to add. Yes, yes, um, sure. No, it was a really good question, Joel. Thank you. Um, and um, I think Lena put it very well. There's also, I think, like what I noticed in the last few months more and more that there's such a um there's such a play on class and caste when it comes to smells and also about like the people who choose to complain about smells you can always notice what like you know oh my my uber smelt a lot of sweat uh, like and then you know going on and complaining about it without recognizing that like why is it smelling of sweat what well, like what is the taxi driver like you know what what has been like his struggles um there's always this like quick repugnance i think when it comes to smells um and again like i think when when we're talking about food there's also like 
I, I in my writing I speak a lot about like rotten food and, and you know some dalit jobs uh, include getting rid of dead animals dead people cremating the manusmriti says that uh, dalit people can only wear clothes from a dead person's body and uh, we don't know, re- recognize that like the smell is a, is an essential part of these experiences um so and then once dalit people sort of gain more and more privilege you know if they're able to get rich if they're able to things like perfume things like um like clean clothes or like things that we take for granted end up becoming such an important part of this power um yeah i can go on but yeah thank you thank you rajeshree thank you everyone so um, over to arna ma'am thank you thank you so much um, rajeshree pranav lena for really being a part of this session for sharing your work your journey uh, your creative approach it's just been fascinating so much to take from and things that really look beyond the surface into something so meaningful thank you